Without further ado, let me introduce tonight's guest. Most Fairbanksans will recognize Ron Inouye's work as both a philanthropist and a volunteer. Earlier this year, he received UAF's Meritorious Service Award for his decades <laughs> of service, both to the school and the community. His university career began in 1970 as an instructor at the Ketchikan Community College. Here at UAF, he managed databases and indexed Alaska's periodicals at the Rasmussen Library's Alaska and Polar Regions collections. Ron has also served as an oral historian, capturing interviews with notable figures. He's co-authored the book, Alaska's Japanese Pioneers. He serves on the Rasmussen Library's Rare Book Endowment Committee, on the board of the Tananai Yukon Historical Society. He is a college Rotarian. He's helped spearhead a successful fundraising effort at the University of Alaska Museum of the North. And he started last Friday's concerts at Raven Landing. So if that wasn't enough, he's our guest tonight. Welcome. Him. So Ron, I always like to begin with family and background. You were born on a farm in Colorado, right? But first I get to Oops. say something. You get to say something? Yes, because I have the floor, obviously. <laughs> I really want to say that Michelle Bartlett and the whole series that she's been running is phenomenal. And without that, we could never have this. And as I was thinking about my career on campus, Michelle was intertwined in a lot of that. And I had no realization that she's been a presence, and a dominant presence for a long time. And I'm very glad that she continues in this role, and I hope the university acknowledges that better than they do sometimes. <laughs> well, that's agreed. And Robert, we have a long history going back, so I hope you're gonna ask about Northern Storyteller and our involvement with KUAC. Well, you so let the cat out of the bag, Ron. <laughs> So let's, the first time I met you was on the Northern Storyteller. And of course that was a series that ran on KUAC FM back in the 80s. Right. Tell me about the, how that, how you got involved in that and um, who, what was the brainchild for that? Well, you know, we were working with intercultural studies and we were interested in finding stories about the North that could be put on radio. And we had a huge number of really good voices in the community, teachers, librarians, even I think the director of the drama department in the theater. And so we got them to read little 15 minute series regularly on the radio. And it was really great fun doing it, but we ended up with grim stories and a lot of things that really weren't Alaskan at all. But it was great fun getting to see the cross section of the community and realizing that there was this dearth of stuff that really dealt with indigenous people any place in the Arctic. And that was really, really very interesting for me because that was just the way that things sort of laid out. But it set the groundwork for a lot of subsequent work that we did to try to get more understanding about that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And Robert was the one who had to be in the theater or in the radio station tweaking everything so that it could be put out on the air. And I remember dear Ellen Witcher, just loving to tell those stories, and Lois Braun, and all the library people. And it was really a great introduction to a group of people I had otherwise probably never had a chance to see. But it was good because the radio covered everything, every place in this community, and it was wonderful. And that's how I met you, and yeah. you made us sound good. Yeah, well, I, it wasn't hard because everybody was so extraordinarily good. They cared about the material. Right. And again, it just underscores, um, I think, we're a storytelling species. And so when we hear stories, that was one of the most popular shows that we produced at KUAC, for hands down. And you know, there are some of those pieces still available through the university library. Mm. So you can go onto their website and do Northern Storyteller and you will hear Marsha Trainer talking there and a number of other librarians. So I think it's great that that lives on. Yep. Yeah. Okay, now that we got that plug out of the way and you're dodging the question about growing up on a farm in Colorado. Mm. So let's go back to that. Right. Sure. I'm interrupting, I apologize. We've got to boost the sound, working on it, but we need to do a reality check in the back of the room first. 
Okay, is this reality to you? Can, can you hear us? It's me that's low. Well, that, you don't have to, but I think your microphone's well placed. At, yes. Yeah. And the light's green. And the light's green. Okay. So. She says it's as loud as it will go. Okay, but this is my work. Is Ron's mic working? Yes. yes. If you can get, 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 put your mic closer to me. Swallow it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak very loud. Does that help? Okay, we'll do it. Oh, that's so uncomfortable. Here, give me that microphone and I'll give you this one. And this one you can hold. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you take it off and I have right. no. But then I have to undress in front of everyone and take all this stuff off again. Yeah. <laughs> There's a cover charge for this portion of the evening. <laughs> Which one do you take off? I think it's this one here. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Grab that one. Okay. So we're talking about Colorado. Yeah. All right. So tell me about how the family came to farm in Colorado and what your early years there were like. You know, this story about immigrants that we're going through right now is a story about my grandparents. My grandfather on my father's side came from Japan. He came to California in about 1926. He was able to start a farm in the Sacramento area on some of the river areas that they had re replenished, recovered. And he was pretty successful as a farmer there. But then there was an alien land law that was passed that disallowed any ownership by Japanese. Uh -huh. So he decided he better start looking for something else. And at the same time, in southern Colorado, right where the Sand Dunes National Monument is, there's a huge valley called the San Luis Valley. That's where I grew up. The wind blew incessantly. And that's the reason I'm not there. <laughs> but it was really interesting. My grandfather went to Colorado, took a look around, and decided that this is a, probably a pretty good place to go. So he gathered about 15 other Japanese families from California, and they migrated to that part of Colorado. They really had to eke out a living on that very sparse land because the topsoil was so thin. And that's why the sand dunes exist. Yeah. Had, had they known that, they probably would never have settled there. But through time, you learn these things, and they were, you know, they were hungry. And they had to raise families, they had to pay mortgages. So they did a lot of early vegetable farming, which meant stoop labor things that no one else would do. And they created really a pretty major vegetable industry in the San Luis Valley for two generations. They were raising cauliflower, things that would involve quite a bit of labor. And they had their own family, so obviously that's where you got your labor. And that continued for several generations until obviously the children were educated and they didn't want to do that anymore, just like I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> So they left. And the result is that over several generations then the number of Japanese farmers in that area declined. But the same thing was true every place. The same thing was true in the Arkansas Valley where there were also Japanese families similarly situated. And it's always interesting to me to see how this happens, whether it's running a restaurant or any kind of business where you depend on your kids to do the work. And then when they have alternatives, because they have had an education, then they do choose to move out. And I think among most Japanese, there's always that push to get education that's highly valued. And it's, I guess it's probably that Confucian ethic that comes from China and that pervades most of the Asian cultures. And I think the other thing that's really interesting too is that it's not just Asians. It's always families where the firstborn gets the property. Then the second, third, fourth, they got to go and make their way in the world. And that's the story of immigration every place. You got to make a living, so you go wherever you can make a living. And you do whatever you need to do to feed your family, because that's your major obligation. So that's the story of what happened with my family. 
and what I think is sort of doubly interesting for them is that when they first went to the valley, they uh, settled in pretty well, but then my grandmother had a heart problem, and the doctor advised the family to leave, so they went back to California, and this was prior to the war. They settled in, and my father worked as a gardener, so he was doing reasonably well. But one of his clients was the sheriff of LA County. And after the war broke out, he pulled my dad aside and said, if you have a place to go, maybe you want to go before the evacuation order comes out for all Japanese Americans to leave anything west of the Rocky Mountains. So my dad immediately took that to heart and they migrated from California back to Colorado. And fortunately, they were able to establish themselves back in that area. But again, it was a matter of farming and trying to make a living and doing whatever they could to try to support themselves and their families and to get the kids educated. So it was interesting that as they were leaving California, my dad was in one of the lead vehicles and I guess they would listen to the radio station and they would hear the story, the Japs are coming, the Japs are coming. So along Route 66, people would be lined up at the borders just to look at them. And they would jeer them or whatever. But whenever they'd have to go across a bridge or anything, they were ordered to roll up the windows so they couldn't bomb the bridges. And then when they would get to the border of the next state, the police were there, the patrol. And then they would be taken to the county seat or wherever to get all their papers processed before they were allowed then to continue their journey. Well, that happened repeatedly until they got to Colorado. And there was a state patrolman waiting there at the border. And the patrolman says, on behalf of the governor of Colorado, welcome to Colorado. Aww. And it was, it was really interesting because that was the same county where I grew up. The governor was Governor Carr. He knew Japanese people. And that section of the road now is called the Carr Memorial Highway. But he lost the election after that. And it was a curse on him. And I don't think he ever recovered from that. But in retrospect, it was interesting because his granddaughter was my student teacher when I was in school. <laughs> and I loved her. <laughs> so these little towns in Antonito and La Jara were very, very small. And it was a community where there were you were Hispanic primarily, or you were Caucasian and usually Mormon. So that was a split. You were Catholic and Hispanic, or you were pretty much Mormon and white. There were a few Episcopalians and a Presbyterian or two stuck in there. But that was the sort of dynamic. So as Japanese, you always feel a little odd because you're not like them. But after a while, you learn to fit in, and people were pretty wonderful. In school, you know, we did everything together and we were a small class. And I remember just enjoying being in, uh, being in school all the time. We were in the time when all the schools were being consolidated. So our class was the last class in that high school. Then they consolidated to a larger system. And it's the same thing that's been continuing to happen in all rural communities. So the little town is not, well, it's still there. And it's about the same size, but the school system has changed dramatically. Yeah. So did you have siblings? And tell me about what the schooling was like growing up. Well, I had a brother and a sister who both died before I was born. Mm -hmm. I had no understanding of that until through going to family reunions, my mother's sisters have told me that she was very, very weak. And I think she had TB and was just physically not very healthy. And she was raised in the Arkansas Valley on a farm. And talk about people who had to work there. Rear ends off, she was one of them. She was the second oldest daughter. And because of that, she had a lot of responsibility. But boy, my grandmother was a real slave driver <laughs> on my mother's side. She had eight kids, two boys. And those kids really worked hard. And because there was such an age separation, the older ones never really knew the younger ones. 
So the younger ones are the ones my, who have talked to me recently, telling me these stories about my mother, stories that my mother had never told me. But she was sort of interesting in that when she graduated from high school, she wanted to go to school, but the family gave the money to the boys, never to the girls. So the boys got educated, they got all the stuff that they should, the girls didn't. So my mother had to be a house girl in Denver so that she could afford to be in Denver and then go to business school. And she was, I'm sure, very good at that. She was very strict, you know. And she couldn't get a job though because she was Japanese. And so she decided she would retool and she went to nursing school and became a nurse. And I really appreciate her because she talked about loving to be a surgical nurse. And she was short, shorter than I even. And so she would take this little box into the surgery room. She put it down and she'd stand on it. And then she'd start handing out the instruments to her dog. And she loved doing that. She really enjoyed being a nurse. But my father and she had met because my mother, my grandmother on my father's side had a heart problem. And this is before they were scheduled to go back to California because the altitude was too high in Colorado. So my dad and my mother were introduced to each other and they got married. Interesting yeah. relationship, I must say. <laughs> well, Ron, given your uh, lifelong, I, I remember one time when we talked earlier, you said that you've always been sort of a lifelong lover of culture, of museums, of books. And uh, so where did that come from? And where did your musical gifts, because you play the piano, where, where did those come from? You know, as I've gotten older, it's really interesting that I think being wonky is sort of cool. <laughs> then it was not. And I didn't have the standard interests of most of the kids, but I tried to play sports. You know, my dad was a really good sports guy. I couldn't play very well. So I'd be the manager or I'd do other things, just to sort of tail along. But I really did get interested in music. And I think it was because of the very interesting teachers I had. The first one was a sister, Hillary, who was really a very, very good piano teacher. But I would go to the nunnery to have my lessons. And I would go in there and wait for my lesson. And I would hear the nuns doing their vespers. And that was the most interesting music I think I had ever heard. Because it was so unlike the Buddhist chanting that we did in our little church. And I was taken someplace else because that was very interesting to me. And then gradually I found other teachers who were equally wonderful in taking me to another place. I had a Maria Morozov who was a white Russian. She taught in the neighboring college, but she had fled Russia. She was teaching in Buenos Aires at the conservatory, but she wanted to come to the United States. And so she ended up in Colorado in this little town where I was. And it was wonderful to see people who were so different, who were so dedicated to what they did. They loved music, they could express it. And you had to work your butt off to meet their expectations. But it was inspiration, and I think that's what has been interesting to me, is to see that if you can get ins people inspired, not threaten them, but inspire them, then you work harder than if you're being threatened to do something. And it was fascinating, you know, I, I didn't know those things, but. That's the way, the pattern that I'm beginning to see now as I get older. Mm. And it's the inspiration that I think made a huge difference. Well, lots of, lots of kids get into piano lessons, but you stayed through it though, um, uh, throughout your life. You still play. Mm -hmm. um, one of your, sad to say, Vera Alexander, mm -hmm. who you used right. to play. My uh, condolences there, but that passion has remained with you. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a way actually to sort of leave this world and go into another Zen moment. I was talking to <laughs> Julie about these Zen moments that sometimes you need when things are pretty hectic. For me, music is like that. It gets you to a place that you haven't been or that you want to go back to. And there's new stuff to explore all the time. But there's also things that's familiar that you really enjoy. 
And that's why Vera and I really enjoyed the last two years. After our Rotary meeting, we would put the pianos together at Raven Landing, and we'd play some really weird stuff, as well as some wonderful Brahms and the things that she loved dearly. But it's a way to reconnect in a way that's very, that's meaningful, it's fun. Okay, well let's get you to college because you study sociology and anthropology. That's right. So what drove those interests? I don't know. I think it was just probably the end of the road and you had to find something that you liked. <laughs> and that combination was pretty interesting, particularly living in southern Colorado, where you have that Spanish heritage that was there before there was a Mexico or a United States. And so the land was there un under land grants. It's flashing red. There it is, it's green again. Anyway, that area was pretty interesting because it was all part of an original Spanish land grant before it was anything else. Indigenous people were there. They were sort of not really considered. Spanish came in, they took over from all of South America all the way into North America. And the, he the legacy of that is still evident in uh, water, of all things. My dad was on the Rio Grande Water Commission, and the Rio Grande River starts right in that area. And he was the token farmer on this commission that had an international treaty with Mexico about water delivery to Mexico and the quality of it. Well. It, became pretty difficult. Maybe we need to swap the batteries? Uh, I think it keeps speaking if you hold it farther from your mouth. Okay, does this come back? Yes. Is this okay? So over a period of time, that became really intriguing to me about the ways that the United States was formed out of what was Spanish America and the ways that trade routes were established and the conquistadors and the conflicts between the indigenous people, the Mexican people, the Americans, the people from the Confederacy, all of that stuff just sort of gets mishmashed together. And trying to tease out all of those elements is not easy. But when you start listening to the music, you can see that there's that combination of things there. But the traditions and the way that land ownership and the way you pass on water rights is very, very different. And that's what got me interested in the anthropology part of that, as well as the sociology of why people react as they do, why are institutions created as they are, and what are those rules, written or unwritten, about how a society behaves. So those things became very, very interesting to me. And I'm pleased that that's sort of the background that I had. It was, it's been help, very helpful, although all the way subsequently. Mm. Well, water rights is a big issue now in the Southwest. But um, this was during the 60s. Now, did any of talk about clashing cultures and, and unrest? Did any of that impact you while you were at college or? Well, I graduated in 68, 69, and there was no work for anyone at that point. So I had my resumes out to many, many different groups and got no nibbles. And so after we harvested our crop, I decided I needed to leave that valley. And I had a friend in Portland, Oregon, who said he wanted to have someone help him start a little business. So everything I owned, I put into my little 65 Malibu and off I went. And it was wonderful going to a new place, which was wet compared to Colorado. But it was fascinating because all of a sudden there was a new group of people and new opportunities in ways that I had never thought about before. And so I lived in a little room that I rented for a very inexpensive with a common bathroom, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But it was interesting because all of a sudden I was living a totally different life. And then at Reed College, there was a wonderful opportunity for a summer, well, a summer workshop that was dealing with uh, the things of the 60s, violence. And they were studying systematically how the rebels of the 60s were creating havoc every place. Sounds like today, doesn't it? And it was fascinating for me to get in with that group of people at Reed College, 
who were very thoughtful. A lot of them were teachers, seasoned. A lot of them were professors. A lot of them were very young people. But it gave me a mix of people that I would otherwise never have had a chance to talk to. And we became very close after that, that period through the summer seminar. But at that point, too, I had had my uh, Vita off to Ketchikan. And when I was there in Portland, all of a sudden the phone rang and said, hey, our professor didn't show up in Ketchikan. You want to come? <laughs> I was there. <laughs> One of the easier job interviews you've had. <laughs> That's right. But once I got there, everyone grills you in ways you'll never know. <laughs> So tell me about arriving at Ketchikan. Did you drive there and take the ferry? Took the ferry and immediately got off, thought, where am I? What am I doing here? But once I got into the college, I met the most wonderful people. Willard Jones was a man who was in charge of the diesel engine program there. He's Haida, Indian. And his wife, Mary Jones, was a Clinkett. She was very strong in A and B, A and S affairs. And they immediately adopted me. And first thing Willard says, well, Saturday night, we're going to an A and B dance. You're coming. So that was my introduction to a wonderful, wonderful family that sort of adopted me and introduced me to a lot of things that I don't think most other people would have had a chance to see. But in a small town like Ketchikan, you know, everyone's business is everyone's business. And so if I would go out and have a drink with someone, everyone in the class knew about it and how long I was there and who was there too. And it became really sort of interesting because all of a sudden it is awkward to do anything because everyone knows everything and the rumors start spreading very quickly. But that was the charm of it, you know, being in a small place like that. And I think the greatest gift that I had was really having a wonderful college director his name was Jim Simpson, and he was sort of stern. But he helped me out a lot, because when I first went to get an apartment, I had no idea the expenses of living in Ketchikan, Alaska. And they had me pay first and last month's rent, plus the current months. That depleted everything I had. And so Jim Simpson co-signed a loan for me so that I could afford to wait until I got a paycheck because of the delayed system that the university has for paying you. And I was so grateful that he would stick his neck out for me like that. Well, subsequently, I found out that he was an Athabascan Indian. His father was Irish. He was sent to the Jesse Lee home as an orphan. And he was very, very good friends with, uh, well, the guy who wrote the Alaska Flag song. Benson. He and Benny Benson were good buddies. And I had no appreciation for the fact that that was his history. And I knew nothing about Benny Benson or any of that when I was living there in Ketchikan. But subsequently, it turns out he was the first Alaska native with an earned doctorate degree. And I, Subsequently, I've been trying. To... I subsequently have been trying to figure out how to get him acknowledged, because that was a pretty major award for him, and he had been in all over the state teaching. Then he ended up in Ketchikan, taught there extensively, and helped develop some of the outreach programs that established the community college, which he then became president of. So his work history and what he accomplished there is pretty major. But when I go back there, no one even knows who he was or who he used to be because the time has passed. And it's that way with everything. I think we know what we know when we know it, but then it's, it's gone. And that's the value of what I think libraries and museums do. They document things in ways that otherwise would be lost. And that's why I'm such an advocate for historic preservation, for documenting things, and for creating a, record, a public record that can be looked at and analyzed and reassessed periodically. But at least it's there. Otherwise, who knows? So. Well, um, Ketchikan is community college, but it's still part of the statewide system. Right. And you said 
part of the influence that drew you to Fairbanks was Dr. William R. Wood, mm -hmm. the president of the UA system. Tell me about that. When you're isolated in the community college system, the bigwigs from the big town come to see you. Ted Ryberg came to inspect the libraries once a year. He was very regular about that, and I got to meet Ted. Then Dr. Wood came, and when he first met me, he knew who I was. He knew what courses I taught. I was shocked. And I was very impressed with the fact that he would start little chit-chatty things, too. And he knew all the other faculty in Ketchikan. And he would ask how classes were going and very personally interested in things. And so that sort of impressed me that someone would do that kind of thing. But additionally, while I was there, since you're the new kid on the block, they get you involved in everything from the arts councils to that kind of thing. And so I got to meet Ron and Turid Sanungatuk with Heidi. They had come down to do a workshop. And so they said, why don't you come and meet them? So we had a wonderful dinner. And it was one of those things where I had another contact up to Fairbanks. And the other one that was very interesting to me was uh, Dick Pacenti. He was the faculty member who had to vet all of my course requests, get them through the council or whatever it was, so that I could teach the courses. And Dick was just so wonderful that he was very easy to work with. So when I subsequently came to Fairbanks, there were people like that who really were very important to me because all of a sudden I had a connection. And that's the way, reason I got involved with Fairbanks Ski Patrol was through Dick Pacenti, obviously. He's always looking for a new recruit. <laughs> and Ron worked with the art department, so I got to understand that group of folks. And it's, it's incremental how we learn these things, I think. Mm. Yeah. So when did you decide to make the move north to Fairbanks? I taught in Ketchikan for three years, and it was too wet. You know, I had this little Chevy Malibu from Colorado, and the seals around the windows had all dried up. It rains in Ketchikan. So I had to take a punch and punch a hole in the floor so that the water <laughs> would drain. And every time I'd get in the car, it would just be fogged up. And I thought, I've had enough of this. So I happened to know that there was a project going on in Fairbanks that uh, seemed very, very interesting. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And it's interesting that Joe Sanangata, Ron's brother, was a member of a group that was formed to take a look at the regional educational attendance areas. And this was when all of the rural areas were being put into 21 school districts. And there was a nice Ford Foundation grant to help make that transition occur. And they were putting together a team of people through the Center for Northern Educational Research to actually go out and do that. So there were a number of us who worked together working with the school boards to teach what the responsibilities were for our school boards, and additionally to work with teachers to start thinking about curriculum. And Kay Hinckley, I don't know if Kay's here tonight, but she and I worked very well together in dealing with how we would work with curriculum that would reflect local cultures and indigenous people. So it was a magic time, and it was really, really a lot of fun to meet people statewide because I got to travel a lot. And had I not had that opportunity, I would never have gotten to you know, some of the more remote parts of the state. But I want to add that one of the things that I think was the most exciting was when uh, you might remember the Foxfire series of publications that came out as a way to get kids to interview elders in their communities and document it. Well, we brought Elliot Wigington up to teach. And we had more fun with teachers from around the state who came in with their students. And they learned that technique of interviewing and documenting the history of their communities. And there are a number of publications that are out based on that Alaska model. Many out with Ann Vick in the southwestern part of the state. And I think Ray Hudson used that model when he was working out in the Aleutians area. But what tickled me the most is that there's a story in Wigington's book called I Wish My Son a Wild Raccoon. And in that volume is our segment when we interviewed, well, Tikasuk Brown. 
And it was just wonderful to have a chance to meet Emily Brown and to get her involved because that was her thing. And she was such an elegant storyteller. And every time I'm invited to go out to Tikasuk Brown, you know, it's part of Guy's Read, I take that book and I tell those kids, you better know who this school is named for because it was named for Emily in Tikasuk. And she told this wonderful story of being named Tikasuk, and she was embarrassed because I guess in her area, it's like a little dip in the ground, a hole in the ground. And she cried because she thought that was so embarrassing. But as she said, as she got older, that's what really got her here to the university in retirement because she worked as a nurse, she worked as a mother's aide, and when she retired, she came to UAF and was residing in, let's see, which dorm? She was in Wickersham for many, many years, sort of like a house mother. But she would go to ANLC and she would write stories from Unilclete talking about the history of the language and of people. And she said, I became my name because in that little dip, I'm accumulating the history of my people. Mm. And I thought that was so wonderful. And you know, people do believe that. You're given a name and you live to that name. And she, she grew to it and she lived it. And when my folks would come up to visit, the first thing they'd say is, where's Emily? Let's go get ice cream. Because we'd <laughs> always go down to Dairy Queen and have ice cream with Emily. <laughs> it was great. Well, um, so I guess I want to ask, uh, jump ahead just slightly because of the, those interviews. I saw Bill Schneider earlier mm. coming in here. And as an oral historian, is that what sparked that interest in you when you did these oral history interviews? Actually, that started when I was in Ketchikan. One of my interests was in documenting the early Japanese in Alaska. And Ketchikan had a large number of so-called Issei, the first generation in the United States. And so I spent a lot of time interviewing the Japanese in Ketchikan. Mm. And I, that sort of got me interested in this whole process of oral histories. And because of that, it sort of parlayed into other kinds of interviews with other groups of people. But my initial interest was in documenting the Japanese Americans. And I think of all the people that we interviewed, none exists now. But I'm so pleased that we have those records. And once we had the tapes, we put them into the state library system. And then I took a system series down to the uh, Wing Luke Museum in, in Seattle where a lot of the Asians are populated and where a lot of Alaska Japanese have retired. And I thought that was an appropriate depository for them. And it tries to carry on a little bit of this contact of Seattle with Alaska, because most people have no clue about, you know, the people who came up to work in the canneries and the subsequent ways that we've always been connected. But it's always been a very unofficial one, but interesting nonetheless. So when you do come up to, to Fairbanks, you're at the Rasmussen Library. No, I was with the Center for Northern Education Okay. in Greening Building. All right. And so that continued for about 10 years. And then we went into uh, sort of a financial depression, as you may recall. So a lot of us didn't have jobs with the university anymore. So I did some consulting on my own for a period of time. And then I started working with Rasmussen Library. Bill had been interested in oral history and we were trying to figure out ways to try to get that program developed. So I helped him and he helped me try to get that going. Because I had previously some contact with people at the East West Center in Hawaii who had done oral histories. And so we started collaborating and just talking shop about that whole process of how you, you archive that and make it into a viable program. Well, and, and all indexing and cataloging, you don't see very many crime shows about that. Um, so it, it lacks a certain cachet maybe, but it's essential for scholarship to have the, that net, if you will, that, that kind of um, organization. So tell me a little bit about how you got there and some of the skills you brought to bear because it was in periodicals, indexing those right. and whatnot. I think most of you who are old timers remember Alaska Geographic, Alaska Journal, 
I was particularly fascinated with the anthropological papers of the University of Alaska. They were terrific. The history of Arctic anthropology is in the pages of those volumes. There was no way that those were going to be digitized and put into any kind of a system because that kind of system didn't exist. So for a period of about seven or eight years, there were three of us down in the bowels of that library trying to pick through what we thought were the critical gray literature, the things that would never make the major indexes. And so we manually index those into a database system, which is very clunky by comparison now. But it introduced and unearthed a lot of literature that would otherwise not have been found. And that was very labor intensive because it took people to physically do all of that. And as a result, I think it opened up a lot of literature that otherwise would not have been. What's interesting to me now is that so much of the material is being retrospectively indexed and scanned for large commercial markets. But there will never be a demand for that kind of product with a small base of Alaska users. So it's one of those critical things that was interesting to do. Very tedious, <laughs> very laborious, because they had very specific standards on how those should have been done. Mm -hmm. And we had really good people who were dedicated to doing that. And I think it's like anything. Once you define it, you will find people who would like to do that. You may think it's boring, but other people find that wonderful. Just like people who love to do taxes, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess when you put it that way. Anyway, um, I want to talk to you about Alaska's Japanese pioneers. You're already documenting, as you point out, um, the history of, down in Ketchikan. How did you come to write that book or co-author that book? Well, I really didn't do any writing. It was more interesting for me to get the oral voices of those people telling their own personal stories. So we were able to get a team of people together to take a more serious look at what the history of Japanese on the West Coast was, and then particularly the role in Alaska. And what was fascinating to me, and which has subsequently become a major issue, is this combination of immigrant men primarily, and their relationship to indigenous people. This was a very, very difficult story to tell because within Japanese culture, that was not allowed. It was forbidden. But many of these Japanese men had native women and many children. And within those families, they instilled education. And so those kids were really sort of forced to go to school. And I am astounded how many of those children now sit on the boards of their village or regional corporations because they have that education. And I think previously a lot of those things would have been a sign of embarrassment, but now we're finding that it's a matter of cultural pride where people are saying, I am half and I'm not ashamed of it. And they're starting to stand up and say, I have skills and this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. It was interesting for me to go down to South America and to see my counterparts in, well, Argentina, Brazil, places that the Japanese who left Japan went in addition to the United States, and to see that there were language classes and cultural classes, the same as we have in this country, trying to relearn Japanese. Well, Jose Yamamoto, you know, it's just like Ron and Owe, curious about your countrymen's history in that place. And it's become a pretty dynamic kind of thing. And I was just listening to some fascinating music today because it's done by some uh, popular Latin musicians taking Japanese folk songs. I couldn't believe it when I heard it because it just sounded so familiar, but yet so different. And I think that's true every place. You know, we take the songs that we know and we transfer them and make them our own. And so it's a hybrid. And I think everything is a hybrid once you start thinking about it. We think we're all on a continuum, but where they set the boundaries is pretty arbitrary. We're finding that true now when we take a look at gene pools and where most people's ancestors came from. The writing is still being done and we really don't know because as soon as they sample more people from Africa and from Asia, 
that genetic map is going to really be very different than the small number of people who can afford those expensive tests and whose data is now on those maps because that's the rich world and that's a very small segment of the entire world. But it's, it's the way that we learn and I think that's what technology is doing for us now. It's teaching us to see the world differently than when we saw it before. It's like going back to the San Luis Valley and seeing those sand dunes and thinking, my God, this is a geologic process. It's been going on for years. And there we were, for this small segment of trying to eke out a living for 10 years versus what's been happening for thousands of years. And yet we saw it and we didn't know it. And I think now we're beginning to know what we see and to question what it is we see so we understand it better. It's a fascinating time to be alive. <laughs> And that's why I think education and museums and libraries are all teaching us, as is what we're seeing a lot online now. We're learning very quickly. We are. You know, we talked about uh, the aftermath of the bombing of Pearl Harbor for Japanese Americans, but another um, research interest and, and uh, interest you had was what happened to the Aleuts mm. with the bombing mm. of Dutch Harbor. Yeah. When I was there in Ketchikan, there was a place called Ward Lake. And I would go out there and I would look at it and it looked like an old, uh, well, work camp of some sort. And I would ask the local people, what happened out there? And they said, oh, that's a WPA project. And I couldn't believe it. And I kept asking and finally I met on a walk a little Aleut lady. She had married a person who lived in Ketchikan. She had been out there removed from the Aleutian Islands and stuck in that camp. So she told me the story and I, I couldn't believe it. But then I started doing more and more research and it got to be very clear that there really was a pretty significant removal of Aleuts from the Aleutian Islands as the Japanese had been removed from, you know, the, the mainland USA. And as I started digging more and more into that story, it got to be pretty, pretty weird. A lot of those people had to be evacuated very quickly. They didn't know where they were going. I had interviewed some of the people working in the Bureau of Indian Affairs who were responsible for the relocation of the Aleut people. They had no warning that these people were coming. So many of them ended up at Wrangell Institute and they were put in like a holding tank there until they could figure out what to do with all these people. So a lot of the mining camps out in Southeast were reactivated. The living conditions were appalling and they had no supply chain to even provide food for the people once they stuck them out there. It was totally, they were underprepared and they had no infrastructure to provide for the people there. And that's why it became such a very, very ripe area for sickness, for a lot of health issues and if it weren't for some of the Clinket people who actually took food to the Aleuts, there would have been mass starvation. But that story really never got told. And over time, we started documenting a bit of that. And I'm glad that we were able to do a certain amount of it because when the uh, war reparations bill for the Japanese Americans became a national issue, Senator Inoue from Hawaii was one of the leaders on that issue. Well, he was good buddies with Senator Stevens. Senator Stevens saw an opportunity to maybe get the story of the Aleuts told. And fortunately, the two of them worked that out. So when the actual reparations bill was introduced, it was a commission on the wartime relocation of civilians, which included the Aleuts. And when the national hearings were held, they were also held in Anchorage, in St. Paul, and Unalaska. So the Aleut people were given a chance to speak. And I think that was so wonderful. And for me personally, that whole adventure was really interesting because my family, none of the Japanese Americans talked about that period in camp. They were embarrassed by it. And so they never told the rest of us, the young people, about it. Well, once the hearings occurred for the commission, it opened the door and people started talking about it. And 
people started streaming to testify. And I think it really unleashed this opportunity for people to have a mass discussion about it. And I think that's how this business of truth and reconciliation that we now see in South Africa, that we now see in many places in the world, came about because all of a sudden people were willing to talk about it and they felt unburdened and they felt a relief that finally that story could be told. And it's, I think it's a very good and I think it's a healing process that otherwise we probably never would have had. So it was, it's interesting to have seen and have been a part of that. You know, I was going to ask whether um, you're working with uh, Tenana Yukon Historical Society and whatnot, um, stemmed from your research, but it sounds like it's been a lifelong appreciation for the value of retaining the stories of the people in place. Would I be right on that? I think that's right. I think any way that you can preserve it, whether it's through physical structures or records, and I love the work of genealogists and of people who work with newspaper articles. I think Joni Skilbred's doing that series in the News Miner that's very interesting because it brings us to a point where there, the information is there but we don't look at it. And you have to put it into some kind of context and you have to bring it back to us in a new way to understand that sometimes these things have happened before. It's like the whole business of what was here before the FE company came and started gold. You know, there had to be a heck of a lot of investment, a lot of tentativeness, a lot of anxiety, but it's not unlike what happened during the pipeline era. You know, it's a, it's a change. The resource has shifted. And I think it's just a process of relearning what is already in front of us. We look, but we don't see, because we never thought to think about it that way. And it's hiding right in plain sight. Um, when I was talking with Mary Erlander, um, you know, I observed that it strikes me that here in Alaska, there is a great deal of interest about our past. And, and it seems like, again, the Tenma Yukon Historical Society and other like um, groups of folks are very passionate and they're very engaged. And that's part of informing the community. And maybe, do you see that maybe as a bridge? There's such deep um, <coughs> social polarization today, it strikes oh. me, that learning about these stories and putting them into context maybe gives a safe environment to address very challenging emotional issues. I think the discussion part of it is very critical. What is very, dis well, hard for me to think about is that I put things on a normal bell curve and you start thinking about any issue and there's always going to be 10% on this side, 10% this side, vast majority in the middle. We know the 10% on this side is always going to be there. They're active, they're involved, they're interested, they're innovating, they're doing whatever. They can also do evil. And I always think about that wonderful Google mantra, do no evil because they saw that technology, they wanted it to go for good. But what's good? Yeah. And under what circumstances? And then what do you do with the majority of the people in the middle who have other interests? You know, they're raising families. They're trying to make payments on things. They're very busy. They don't want to get involved in this other stuff because it's not personally affecting them directly. And so it's a matter of getting people's attention and then having them take some decisive action on it. What's interesting also is that I've been thinking a lot about everyone saying, oh, it's all going to average out. I don't think so. I think everything is a matter of extremes. The 60s were very liberal. Look at us. People liked that for a long time. And this was during a time when there was prosperity there were good salaries. A lot of people were in that bulge. Then it shifted and people didn't like that so much. Some of the people who were in that sector shifted and others who never liked it have united and all of a sudden we're going to the other extreme. The question is how low do you go? 
before it shifts to become the other extreme. Well, if you take an average, it's always looking backwards through a mirror. And it's never something you should use to project forward because you don't know what the circumstances are. You don't know what the new technology is going to do to bite you in the butt or what climate change is going to affect what you think is going to happen. There's always an unknown. But to think that we can average things out and that there is an average is sort of dicey as far as I'm concerned. I think all we can do now is to do the best we can with what we got, with the best guidance that we have, whether it's morals or religion or philosophy or ethics. That's the level on which we have to work on a very personal level, because I'm sure that there are bigger things that we can deal with, but I'm not sure you can move the needle on those. But I think you can do things, saving records <laughs> for the library, for the museum, being kind to people, sharing what you've got. And we're the beneficiaries of all of that. You know, we're the bulge that is now eating up all the resources. <laughs> But we have those resources, and that's our obligation, I think, is to share that and to do the best we can under the circumstances we're in, because who knows what's going to happen. I was just thinking, this interview is like a, well, like a generative AI. You know, who knows what's what and where the information is coming from? Because when I try to put my life story together, I pick, I cherry pick. And I think that's what the generative AI does, it cherry picks what, but maybe that's what we are. I have no idea. <laughs> but it makes me think that we need to be on our toes all the time, questioning things, being somewhat critical. But I think more than that, trying to make things a little bit better for, for someone or for something. Because I see the kids playing, you know, and I always think about what do they know about Vietnam? What do they know about the Middle East war? What do they know about the Ukraine? They don't. And I don't know how you teach that without, well, with all the values and other things that are part of that. But young people, you know, they have a clear slate and they have no idea. So all you can do is work with them and try to inspire them as I think my teachers have done for me to do the best you can and to inspire you to something that you never thought you would want to. Who knew? <laughs> well, um, I remember um, we were talking and you suggested a last question. So I'm gonna hold that oh. as the ace up my sleeve. But it strikes me to preface it that like so many in the Tall Timber series, you are doing more now today than probably when you had a job. So is, is, part of, is part of that engagement what you're pursuing right now when you talk about these, you're part of the museum, you're part of the Rotarians, you're starting the last Friday. All of these ventures are things you're, you're actively engaged in and with this idea of maybe enriching the community. I think the real value for me is that as you get older, you know more people, and you know what their interests and passions are, and you can try to connect them in some way. And that's what's interesting to me, is to try to bring people who may have similar interests together so that they can both mutually benefit from their common interests or common goals. And as you get older, you just sort of refine that process a little bit. And I, I look around this room, and my goodness, these are all wonderful people. And I know them in different contexts. But when you put them together, shh, watch out. <laughs> these are the folks that do things, and they think things. And they're very kind and considerate. And I think that's a dynamic combination. And this community, and I think most communities are like that. You just have to help bring that together a little bit. I just love the ideas of endowments and of creating legacies that way, where people can come together for a common cause. And even though we don't have a lot of money independently, we can make it 
work together. We can challenge each other. But that's the way you identify people and their passions, is by what is it that you want to be your legacy. And I think we all have something deep down, maybe we're not articulating it, but there are ways to help that, whether it's scholarships for kids, for music, for sports, for whatever. But we all have something there that's really important to us. And we just need to act on it in some, some positive way. And I think we do. I really do. We just need to share it more widely so that we can identify other people who have similar feelings. Yeah, I enjoyed coming to Fairbanks because when I first came, they said, you're going to go to Square Banks? <laughs> and I always wondered what they meant by that. But you know, this really is a very odd place. <laughs> you do all of Shakespeare in one week. You go skiing in the dead of winter. You go biking when it's 50 below. You climb, you know, you go on marathons and all of these weird things that other people think are pretty strange. But around here, that's the way people express themselves and they do it. And everyone applauds them and no big deal. It's wonderful. <laughs> so is that the secret of getting old? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you know, I had a chance about a week ago to go down to Sitka for the music festival. I haven't been there for a long time, but I always had a special place because Paul Rosenthal was part of starting that group up. And I had a cabin on Miller Hill Road where Liz and Bill Berry lived, so I got to know them. And when I knew that Paul was retiring, I knew that Zul Bailey, who was, comes up to play regularly on the cello, was uh, trying to honor Paul in some way. So they actually bought a little house there on the Sheldon Jackson campus, Stevenson Hall, and they're refurbishing that as a way for the music camp to continue. And they were setting up some displays to honor Paul. Well, I took a look at that mural in the Noel Wayne Library, you know, uh, the parade and this Arctic fairy tale with a mastodon leading the parade, and there is Paul Rosenthal fiddling. And I thought, well, that's got to go there. And it tied Bill Berry, it tied all of this stuff together. So I had that framed and I took it down there and they put it into Stevenson Hall. But what really shocked me was that I did not realize the way that they have funded that Sitka Music Festival was because of Helen Walker. She started the endowment and it's amazing to see how that has really helped them. And Grace Scheibel was the second person, two Verbanks people. And the third person was George Ishiyama with the local pulp company there in Sitka. And those three people had the vision to put together that endowment. And thank goodness they did because it's helping that little music festival grow and to continue. And what I wanted them to know was that there is a history to that festival. And the new people, Zul doesn't know that. The guy who's actually doing all of the coordination, he's is from New York, I think, very capable guy. But he had no idea of the history. So that was my way to try to anchor that organization a little bit because that's what I know. I can't do anything about it when I'm 10 years from now. So that's what you do. Well, about this time, um, each week we open up questions for people in the audience who know Ron or want to highlight an aspect of your experience with him. Anybody have a question for him? <laughs> Are you going to continue to come and play for us at Raven Landing? <laughs> Are you going to continue playing at Raven Landing? We've had certain requests. I think Julie Scott's doing a pretty good job, so maybe we'll switch off here doing that. We'll see how the calendar fits. It was really a lot of fun to be there with Vera and to play. Yeah. And I think that's the real key is that she donated that wonderful grand piano. And to make use of that was the reason that we started this Friday, last Friday series. And to try to get all of the wonderful musicians in this town who are teachers but don't perform regularly, we'd like that group of people to have a platform so that they can sing and play and perform. 
and it's only an hour program, so I think it's a format that would work. We just have to grow it now. There's the ringer in the audience. <laughs> Can't beat that for a uh, thing. Thank you, everybody, and thanks to Ron in the way. Thank you.